Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to Marlene for George Washington and for the Central Asian program. Uh, it's always nice to come back. Um, today I was thinking I would follow Noah discussing from Central Asia to the borderland of Central Asian uh, fighters, the Caucasian foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq. So uh, now I'll give more an assessment of the threat of returnees uh, in Russia and Central Asia and what can we expect as ISIS is shrinking uh, slowly but surely, what can we expect about the behavior of foreign fighters? the decision whether or not they're coming back home, whether or not they change their short-term objective. So in order to do so, I'll start by motivation. Who are they? What are the two waves of foreign fighters? The typical two waves that we've seen in Western countries, but also in all Central Asia, usually, and the Caucasus. I'll look quickly on the roles, and especially on fragmentation. What happened from the fitna between Al-Qaeda and ISIS? What was the impact on uh, the Jamaat, the North Caucasian Jamaat in Syria, in Iraq, and also at home in the North Caucasus? Finally, I'll discuss about the threat of returnees, uh, most likely focusing on the Russian intervention. Um, sometime when I'm at home in Canada, Sometime when I'm in, at home in Canada and I'm discussing about the intervention, uh, people tell me that I'm pro-Russian, uh, I'm a Russian puppet, and then the Russian FSB agent in the room or the crew agent come to see me telling me I'm not welcome anymore in Russia. So hopefully I'll find a middle ground today uh, discussing about the situation. We usually see the foreign fighters, and we don't see it right now, uh, in two major waves of foreign fighters. Between 2011 and 2013, we had the, for, the first uh, wave of foreign fighters in Syria, most likely coming from the diaspora. Uh, not many fighters were, in fact, from Russia itself. They were not from the North Caucasus. They were, in big part, Chechens from the diaspora in Turkey, in Georgia, and in Western Europe. In 2011, in fact, to, in, a similar, in a similar conference in 2013 or 2014, we had a discussion about what is going on with Caucasian in Syria, what's going on uh, compared to what we can expect for the Sochi Olympic. And as a good academic, I said, oh, I don't care. I care about my insurgency in the North Caucasus, and you know, it's always the same thing. Everybody sees Chechens abroad, they start in Pakistan, they start out in Central Asia, they start it in Afghanistan, but at the end of the day, they are usually Uzbek or Tajik. They are very rarely Chechens that fought abroad. Uh, and a reminder, there were not a thousand Chechens fighting in Tora Bora in 2001. In fact, the foreign fighters Chechen is a myth. So as many of researchers said, we don't care about foreign fighters, we don't care about Syria, we have our insurgency. Suddenly, as the Islamic State arrives, we start to reconsider. I'll, if I ever get back my PowerPoint, I'll demonstrate that the data is clear. There was not much going on in 2013 at the beginning of the Syrian war in 2011, 2012, 2013. But as it goes, we see a profile change. Coming back to my wave, I was in the North Caucasus spending time with Salafis and insurgents in 2011 during the crisis beginning in Syria. And most of the Salafis, most of the most radical people told me, we don't really care about Syria. We have our jihad, we are fighting, and we always fought against the Russians. There's no reason for us to go abroad. In other words, the people that were going abroad in 2012, 2013, were people that could not access the jihad in the North Caucasus. Fighters that had to, had to left the insurgency in, to, in 2004, 2005, 2006, and were hiding in Turkey. Young people from the diaspora that were too young to have fought in the first or the second war. That didn't really have the chance. Syria was seen as a training camp. Syria was seen as, if we cannot fight the Russian now, we'll go get experience a bit, fighting Bashar al-Assad, and we'll come back. There was experiment fighters. There was a core that fought along the Chechens, along the Dagestanese, um, during and at the core of the Second Chechen War. In other words, the core of what will construct the Jama'at in Syria and Iraq 
are people that had military experience, that were insurgents, that were trying to prolong or to develop their career. I'll change my PowerPoint in case. The second wave starts with the Islamic State. By the end of 2013, the beginning of 2014, a lot of young idealistic Salafis from Dagestan, from Chechnya, start to get more interested by the entire idea of the Islamic State living under Sharia law. In fact, Moscow strategically start to distribute passports and paperwork and tickets to leave for Syria. In fact, Moscow has exported their fighters starting in 2014 in villagers, people that were not even allowed to travel to Mahashkala, people that were not even allowed to go to Moscow, were suddenly allowed to go to Turkey, allowed to go to Istanbul, and they have nice passports saying, yeah, go abroad. People that we knew that, was, that were preachers, that were not allowed to leave their homes, suddenly appeared in, in Iraq in 2014-2015. The idea here was that a lot of the a lot of the younger crowd that I was hanging out, the one that we cal qualified as Salafis, suddenly seen the Islamic State as an occasion. But most of them didn't have the intention of coming back home. It was leaving for good. It was leaving for a better world. Leaving for the Islamic State. The majority of those young people were killing mass. Uh, in in Kobane and Baiji, they were most likely used at cannon fodder. None, uh, the mortality rate among young Salafis is extremely high uh, in Syria and Iraq in 2014-2015. If I have the data, I would show you. Uh, there is very little number of fighters until 2013. And then suddenly the spike, uh, the numbers are spiking. Obviously, Russia has been pushing the agenda that there's a growing threat for, uh, for Central Asia, a growing threat for Russia and for North America in, uh, along the Islamic State. What we know from the number of fighters, and normally I would have my slides, it's going exponentially from 200 about in July 2013 to close to 5,000 at the beginning of 2016. Those numbers were probably too low in 2013 and extremely high now. But what we know is, even if we consider that among those 5,000 people that the Russian security forces are talking about, let's consider 10 or 15 percent of women and children. The normal numbers that we've seen in Western countries, in Canada, in Germany, in France, in the US, we see usually in the second wave a lot of women and families going abroad. We believe that mortality rate among foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq is somewhere between 27 to 30 percent to as much as 50 percent. We know, as I said, that the second wave of North Caucasian fighters has been decimated uh, in Iraq and also in Syria. So let's put this number to roughly 40 to 50 percent of mortality rate. We still have between 1,500 to 2,000 number, 2,000 fighters as a very uh, moderate number of fighters that have the potential to come back to the North Caucasus, come back to Russia, or even in Central Asia. As a way to compare, <laughs> as a way to compare, in 95 and 96, when Khattab and the other foreign fighters, the Arab Afghan, came into North Caucasus, they were roughly between 200 and, 200 and 300, maximum. And they literally changed the face of the insurgency, changed the ideology, established training camp. They had a major impact on the insurgents. So the number, even if we are in the lower bracket, 1,000, 1,500, are astronomical. They can radically change the face of an insurgency that has been going down since 2011. What do we know about the Caucasian fighters in Syria? We know that they have breakdown uh, along the fitna line between ISIS and Al-Qaeda between the end of 2013 and 2015. What is surprising about this fragmentation 
is that we do not see any intra-ethnic or intra, I would say, kinship violence between factions, between Chechen factions, Dagestani factions. We see very little fitna in terms of violence between Muslims, between Al Qaeda and ISIS, in the in what we consider the sample of North Caucasian fighter. Why? Because most probably they do not understand the jihad the same way we think we understand it. It is not a takfiri jihad. It is not a Salafi jihad. It is an ethno-religious jihad mixing kinship, mixing tradition of fighting among Dagestani, Avars, Dargians, Chechens, where there's a layers of honors, tradition, revenge, and jihad. In other words, a lot of people see the mid-term and long-term effect of jihad. If you kill someone abroad, there might be, that might create problems at home for your family, for your clan, for your friends. In other words, you can fight for a different faction, but you will not fight in between factions, which is extremely different from what we have seen from Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS. What we have seen also is, North Caucasian faction were very independent from 2012 until recently. More and more we have seen that because they have encountered a lot of loss, because they cannot gather as much resources from Turkey, from the Islamic State, from the Gulf countries, they have slowly been replaced by Arab fighters. So what we have seen is that Caucasian fighters, most likely Chechens, Kiss, Avars are slowly being stuck in between the choice of dying, fighting among themselves, or surging or joining bigger Jamaat, Jabhat al-Nusra, or other um, organizations. I had a map also to show you about the Russian intervention in the Middle East. We have like to believe that Russia has intervened strictly to support Bashar al-Assad, strictly to create a balance and to export their power in order to obtain some concession about Ukraine. But if you look at the airstrikes all around the region, Moscow is strategically targeting every site of Caucasian and Russian-speaking militants whether it is in Latakia, in Aleppo, and the reason why Bashar al-Assad's forces and other group along, the, uh, along Bashar al-Assad are pushed to Aleppo is most likely because the groups, uh, the Caucasian group, the Russian-speaking group, are fighting Bashar al-Assad. In other, in other words, Russia is fighting a preemptive war against terrorism coming back at home. If the problem of returnees was very problematic in 2014, 2011, uh, 2015. Suddenly, with the Russian intervention, although very brutal, although indiscriminate, although targeting civilians, all of these things, yes. But Russia is acting very smartly to avoid any issues with the returnees. At the same time, if you, uh, you might know or not, but Russia has started a campaign of target assassination in Turkey targeting Imarat Kafka's network and every network that was connecting the North Caucasus, Georgia, Turkey, and Syria. In other words, they can go, we'll give them passport, we'll give them even money, we'll buy them the plane ticket. But the network to bring them back slowly disappears. And Turkey has been very offended by this kind of behavior. Russia will not admit it. Russia will tell me that I'll never go back to Russia. But we know for a matter of fact that in the last four years, Several members of the network, what we call the Istanbul network linking Imarat Kafkaz to Syria, is slowly disappearing. In other words, Russia has been fighting an anti-terrorist campaign at home with the target assassination against Imarat Kafkaz in Turkey and abroad with preemptive strikes. We can disagree with the way Russia is doing it. We might disagree on the fact of supporting Bashar al-Assad, but for the region, for the North Caucasus, for Central Asia, Russian intervention might very well stabilize the threat okay. coming from returnees. And the question at this point is, what will happen as ISIS is shrinking? Usually any organization, terrorist organization, that is shrinking slowly, that cannot convert, control and convert resources on their territory will slowly export 
terrorist act that we have seen in Paris and Lebanon. We can expect in the next three to five years that ISIS will be shrinking and will, will be a spillover of terrorist violence and insurgent violence in the region, as well as Western Europe. In other words, Russian-speaking militant might be much more a problem for Western world from the mid for the Middle East than it is for Russia or Central Asia. The biggest issue for Central Asia and for Russia remains potential lone wolves that will be coming back, that might serve their time for fighting abroad, and after serving their time, acting as a lone wolf in a terrorist attack. However, from what we know, there is less and less opportunity, even if ISIS is officially involved in, the, in North Caucasus and transformed the North Caucasus insurgency as a province. Officially, Imarat Kafkas disappeared from the North Caucasus and uh, North Caucasus and now a vilayat of ISIS. The problem is the insurgency of the North, the North Caucasus is completely eliminated. It is depleted. It doesn't have any more resources. Russia was able to kill the major leaders and for the leaders that remain, they left for Syria. In other words, we are actually in a big vacuum in the North Caucasus. A vacuum we don't know who can, will, who will be able to fill up. The generation who, fight, who fought the first and the second Chechen war are all dead now. By 2011, 2012, they were all killed by the Russians. <coughs> so the generation who established the, the Islamic, the Salafi network in the North Caucasus have disappeared. The next generation is stuck right now in Syria and Iraq with not easy access to coming back. If they come back, they need to establish network. As most of you know, when you deal with clanic society, when you deal with kinship society, in order to survive in an insurgency, you need to be able to extract resources from locals. Locals will only trust people linked to their clan, only trust people that are close to them. ISIS can send foreign fighters. ISIS can send Arab fighters, but they will not be trusted by the network. They will not be trusted by the locals. In other words, it might take as much as five years to reestablish slowly the basis of a Salafi Takfiri uh, insurgency. I can at least give you the number of the fighters. <laughs> takfiri fight. As I was trying to explain, <laughs> if you look at that, you see a very exponential growing of fighters. But the problem is, early on, Russia downsized the trip. But we can expect that it was maybe a bit higher. And now they inflate the threat in order to justify the intervention in Syria and to justify the, the fear of ISIS. We see more a linear increase. But as I said, as it increases, the mortality rate is extremely high. There's a lot of those 5,000 people that are children and women. So in other words, as the airstrike will continue in Syria, as the fighting around Aleppo will continue. We should see the mortality rate going up quickly here. In other, way, in other words, Russia preemptive strike will be very efficient and linked to the target assassination in Turkey and the depleted insurgency in the North Caucasus. And again, I, I don't like to predict things about the North Caucasus. But from what we see with numbers, most likely the foreign fighters returning will not be a major threat for Russia. It might be for Moscow, but it will not be for the North Caucasus. And as I said, we will need several years in order to replenish the networks. In 2006, <laughs> when Shamil Basayev was killed, it took relatively almost three to four years to re-establish the network to establish the Marat Kafkas across the region. And in that time, it means that it takes three to four years when there were existing <coughs> fighters with local networks, with experience of two Chechen wars, 10 years of fighting experience. So far, we don't have network, we don't have foreign fighters, and we don't have recruitment and resources. So it wouldn't be far-fetched to believe that it will take at least five to six years to re-establish a, a major threat inside of the Russian territory. Again, we're in the realm of prediction, 
and social science is extremely bad at it. Thank you very much. Thank you.